Well, uh, good morning, everybody. <coughs> I'm, um, I hope you also enjoyed yesterday's beginning of our conference as much as I did. I'm very happy to be here, and I must vow it's, it's true. It's, I think, the first uh, mnemonic conference that I've been to, but it's certainly not the first memory conference. And I must also add, you can sum up whatever Yerula just has said with the words that I'm a true memory addict. So I've been <laughs> with the business for quite some time and I'm very happy to be here and uh, would like also to extend my gratitude um, to Astrid and her wonderful team. Um, not only what they're doing <clears throat> right now, by the way, I need a little glass of water. <clears throat> Right now, for, for us, uh, during these three days in Frankfurt, but what Astrid has also built up here in Frankfurt, to, uh, for, for Frankfurt to have become a hotspot, a real <clears throat> uh, enormous um, place for memory studies, enlarging it uh, transnationally, and also making it such a wonderful, vibrant place for young researchers. I'm, I'm really impressed with it. Astrid, thank you very much for doing all of this. <clears throat> now, oops, this is, has oh, come down. Okay. Now, can you hear me? Not, not yet. Um, am I audible? Till you can hear me? Okay. <clears throat> now, Holocaust memory has itself a life in history responding to generational changes, media changes, cultural changes and political changes. A living memory cannot only be outsourced solely on media and monuments alone, but needs to be actively transmitted across generations. This transmission takes place within social and political frames, which have normative and formative power because we remember in order to belong. The concept of social frames comes from Maurice Halbwachs, it was already introduced yesterday, who reminded us that an individual memory is never isolated, but always influenced and mediated by the groups to which we belong. Like, like a picture frame, a social frame, <clears throat> and this is a very easy definition of a frame, like a picture frame, the social frame is always selective, cutting out certain things, which are placed in plain view and highlighted for attention while ignoring or forget, forgetting other subjects. Aspects. The affiliation to certain groups and their social frames is responsible for how we position ourselves in the history of the Holocaust with respect to different roles of victim, perpetrator, resistor, uh, victor or bystander and secondary witnesses. Little attention has so far been paid to the various frames of transmission and the question how individuals and groups position themselves vis-a-vis -vis the traumatic past. In the following, I will explore three different frames of transmission, reconstructing their historical perspectives and genealogies. But before we can discuss these frames of Holocaust memory, we have to start with forgetting. Right after the war, some survivors like Primo Levi, Elie Wiesel or Robert uh, Antelm felt an intense obligation after their miraculous survival to tell their stories. It became their mission as survivors to act as witnesses for those who had died disgraced, abused, exploited and unnamed in the camps. More often than not, however, these acts of witnessing occurred against a backdrop of silence woven out of the texture of ignorance, denial and indifference. The eager would-be witnesses had to face the fact that they were addressing a society that had no place for their testimonies. The nightmare that they already had and that had haunted the inmates in the camps indeed became true after the war when they discovered that their friends and neighbors were unwilling to listen and preferred to move ahead and leave the past behind. In her memoir, Still Alive, Ruth Klüger tells an incident with her American aunt who instructs her about the proper conduct of an immigrant in the US. 
the aunt tells her, you have to erase from your memory everything that happened in Europe. You have to make a new beginning. You have to forget what they did to you. Wipe it off like a chalk from, like chalk from a blackboard. And to make me understand better, she gestured as if wiping a board with a sponge. When <clears throat> Ruth Lüger proved recalcitrant to this injunction, she was sent to a psychoanalyst who was to help her to forget. When this incident happened in the, in the late 1940s and early 1950s, America was fully in the grip of the immigration policy of the melting pot, which was driven by the spirit of modernity and the idea of progress, and had no use for the past. Oriented exclusively towards the future, this time regime prevented the possibility of publicly communicating and sharing the memory of the Holocaust. There was as yet no social frame for paying attention to the traumatic past as a vital ingredient of the present and for acknowledging the experience of the victims as an urgent element of their identity. Adhering to the past was generally considered to impede the principle of progress. This conviction prevailed not only in the US, but also in Europe during the Cold War. <clears throat> it was clearly expressed by Winston Churchill in 1946 six in a speech that he gave in Zurich. Addressing the students of that university, he called for an end to reckoning and <clears throat> for wiping the slate clean. He said, we must all turn our backs upon the horrors of the past. We must look to the future. We cannot afford to drag forward across the years that are to come the hatreds and revenges which have sprung from the injuries of the past. If Europe is to be saved from infinite misery and indeed from final doom, there must be an act of faith in the European family and an act of oblivion against all the crimes and follies of the past. Within this temporal orientation, there was no place for remembering the Holocaust. The result was that in Western countries, Holocaust survivors who were intent on acting as witnesses or wanted to talk about their past, found themselves cut off from the societies in which they lived. This silence, as Paul, uh, Saul Friedländer rightly emphasized, did not exist within the survivor community. It was maintained in relation to the outside world. Annette Vivianca has shown how in the first decade after the war, Holocaust memory remained largely confined to the victim groups. Living estranged from the rest of society in pockets of a counterculture, the survivors were left alone with their memories, sharing them only with family members and other survivors with whom they commemorated their dead. It was the Eichmann trial in Jerusalem that broke the silence and prepared the ground for a new collective memory of the Holocaust. While in the Nuremberg trials, <clears throat> the German perpetrators had been in the focus uh, of the tribunals, the Eichmann trial in Jerusalem changed the setting completely. It presented only one perpetrator who was confronted with many witnesses, focusing this time on the victims. While in Nuremberg, the trial had the function to shed light on the murderous system of Nazi Germany's extermination policy, the trial in Jerusalem had the function to highlight the suffering of Jewish victims creating for them for the first time a televised public, even a global arena, authorizing them as historical witnesses and validating their testimonies in the context of an emerging new national narrative. This new acknowledgement of victims found its institutional frame in Yad Vashem, Israel's national memorial of the Holocaust, a continuous project dating back to 1953. The Eichmann trial and Yad Vashem in Jerusalem were the beginning of a national narrative for the state of Israel, founding it on the memory of the victims, <clears throat> focusing, in other words, on the Holocaust as a chosen trauma. <clears throat> 
I call <clears throat> the frame of transmission that evolved from and corresponds to this national narrative the identification mode. For a group that has suffered a genocide <clears throat> which is the attempt at a total extinction of all living and future members, this is what genocide means, this experience remains a continuous menace that is passed on from generation to generation and becomes an indelible trait in the DNA of the group. Same is uh, also true for the Armenians. The Jewish response to this deep scar, marking also later generations, is individual and collective identification. In this frame, the process of transmission is based on strong genealogical links and guided by the principle of identification with the victims. This identification <coughs> connects the present with the past and the dead with the future and succeeding generations. As these victims were not targeted uh, <clears throat> for what they had done, but for who they were, the genocidal violence of the Nazis hit all European Jews, irrespective of the nations to which they belonged, with the special aim of destroying their future. This further explains why individual remembering is closely connected to the collective Jewish history of family, diaspora community, and the nation of Israel. There are different forms in which identification shapes the process of Jewish transmission. A prominent example is the children of Holocaust survivors who refer to themselves as 2G, standing for second generation, defining themselves as a group with seminal common features <clears throat> and a collective identity. These children willy-nilly identified with their parents by not only sharing their history, but also their trauma, appropriating it unconsciously as part of their own self. In the collective psychological anamnesis of their generational predicament, they discovered that from early on, they had been implicated into the trauma of their parents, who had reenacted and transmitted it to their children unconsciously in the embodied symbiotic relationship of everyday life. The distinctive and liberating move of the two Gs, and we have to add that many, many artists come from this particular generation. Art Spiegelman, Maus is uh, just only one example. <clears throat> so the liberating move for them was to transform the unconscious imprint of the trauma that they had come to share viscerally into a conscious identification and thus into a central feature of their identity. More generally speaking, identification is a form of relating to other persons, whether real or <clears throat> mythic or fictitious, in such a way that the distinction between self and other is blurred or bracketed. Identifi identification in the case of the members of 2G meant that the borderline between the identity of the parent and that of the child had become porous, and that this was later on acknowledged not only as a stigma and handicap, but also as an individual <clears throat> mark and asset. We are dealing here not only with the generally acknowledged syndrome of transgenerational trauma, but with the more general condition of what Marianne Hirsch has for what Marianne Hirsch has supplied the term post-memory. By including into her term both identification and disidentification, by moving between filial and affiliative positions, and by transforming what had been dealt with as a psychological and genealogical topic into an issue of aesthetic practices, Marianne Hirsch has opened up this discourse also for new approaches to Holocaust literature and art. Identification, however, does not only relate to a specific group among the second generation of Holocaust survivors, but also applies more generally to Jewish culture, its acts of remembering and rites of commemoration across generation. One example is that the taking is <clears throat> that of taking on the name of a child that died in the Holocaust as a symbolic sibling in the religious ceremony of Bar and Bat Mitzvah. 
This symbolic gesture confirms not only the personal identification with an individual child victim, but also in a more general <coughs> sense, the integration of the dead into the living memory of the community. Another formative collective experience is the March of the Living, an educational tour that brings Israeli families <coughs> and other Jewish families school children to Auschwitz, where they reenact and re-experience culturally and collectively <clears throat> the trauma of their families and the nation by personally connecting with the historical side of suffering and death. Identification in this case does not only take place in the frame of family history, but also within a national narrative, as it has become part of school programs and state institutions. This is why in this context the flag is used very much like a prayer shawl, providing protection from the trauma that is personally reenacted at the historical site and at the same time symbolizing the community of the living that survived the threat of total extinction. A third example um, of a reenactment um, or living history is a new form of teaching and learning history via identification that was developed in the United States and that has spread to many countries. In some Israeli schools, and a colleague told me that <clears throat> uh, his son one day came home uh, and asked him, showed him this picture and asked him whether they had clothes at home so he could dress up as a, as a Jewish child in the Warsaw Ghetto. <clears throat> by reenacting the iconic photo of the young boy and other families harassed by German SS officers in Warsaw, the past is brought to life in the classroom via identification and embodied personification. Uh, the, the only problem was that many of the boys in the school rather dressed up as SS um, soldiers uh, holding guns than as a <clears throat> harassed little boy. These boys and girls are not only remembering the past event, but also staging and feeling it themselves in their own flesh and blood. Jewish family rituals of Pesach, in which the story of the Exodus is re-experienced annually, and Israeli national rituals run parallel or converge in their identification mode of this memory culture. Five years after Churchill's speech and a decade before the Eichmann trial, Hannah Arendt commented on the prevailing silence after the end of the Second, uh, <clears throat> Second World War. She emphatically criticized the normative implications of the modernist time regime with its exclusive emphasis on progress, replacing these concepts with a new configuration of ethical values. In the foreword to her book, the Origins of Totalitarianism, 1951, she defined four principles that, in retrospect, we can identify today as the foundation of a Holocaust memory that was realized only four decades later in the 1990s. So she was alone when she wrote this. Nobody read this, nobody took this up. It was not a topic <coughs> to talk about. Like the Eichmann trial, these principles also laid, I would argue, the theoretical foundations of a Holocaust memory, but this time it was not geared to the victims, but to the perpetrators and the ethical obligation of taking responsibility. I give you just four quotes from this um, introduction. The first is that Arendt wrote about the horrors of the Second World War in a way that was opposite <coughs> of the call for closure or Schlussstrich propagated by Churchill. According to Arendt, the massive war crimes and genocide marked a rupture and deep caesura in history, and I quote her, where all hopes have died, including the idea of progress. By the way, this is what Lyotard then later said in 1979 <clears throat> with the end of the grand narratives. This is what she's already arguing in 1951. And she added, after the experience of the Holocaust, a new era begins in which, and this, these are her words, the essential structure of all civilizations is at the breaking point. And I would argue that Dandina's notion of the Zivilisationsbruch is just a, a contraction of this particular phrase. Second point, Arendt argued 
that in its final stage, totalitarianism had produced an absolute evil, absolute in the sense that it can no longer be deduced from humanely comprehensible, comprehensible motives. Not only for those who had been targeted by the violence that had been unleashed, this experience has culminated in a negative revelation, which Arendt qualified as the beginning of a new era, <coughs> the knowing of the truly radical nature of evil. Third point, this negative revelation urgently required an answer in the shape of a practical response. This meant for Arendt the safeguarding of human dignity on a new political, legal and universal level. Human dignity, she wrote, needs a new guarantee which can be found only in a new political principle, in a new law on earth whose validity this time must comprehend the whole of humanity while its power must remain strictly limited, rooted in and controlled by newly defined territorial entities. I would argue she called here for a new implementation of human rights. And the last point concerns a new memory culture. In addition to a new human rights policy, Arendt demanded a further response consisting in a changed value of memory. In the middle of the culture of forgetting, she called for remembering as a new form of ethical obligation. <clears throat> And this is now, I would argue, her counterstatement to Churchill's words. She said, we can no longer afford to take that which was good in the past and to simply call it our heritage, to discard the bad and simply think of it as a dead load which by itself time will bury in oblivion. The subterranean stream of Western history has finally come to the surface and usurped the dignity of our tradition. This is the reality in which we live. And this is why all efforts to escape from the grimness of the present into nostalgia for a still intact past or into the anticipated oblivion of a better future are vain. The guiding principle of her argument <clears throat> was creating a Holocaust memory and guarding against forgetting, against the expectation that time and progress will eventually lessen the burden of guilt. Her perspective is that of a remembrancer, to apply a medieval term for the collector of taxes, the remembrancer he was called. The remembrancer now reminds Germany and other complicit nations of their responsibility in the genocide of European Jews, creating at the same time a stance of universal ethical responsibility to acknowledge this seminal crime of the 20th century by embracing this new form <coughs> of remembering. <coughs> Arendt argues that this past will have to become the focus of continuous retrospective attention, examining, I quote her, examining and bearing consciously the burden which our century has placed upon us. Arendt's four principles, the caesura created by a rupture in civilization, the negative revelation of an absolute evil, the necessity of a new human rights policy and the claim for an ethical form of remembering are indeed the foundation of a new memory culture of uh, the Holocaust that had to wait, however, <clears throat> almost half a century before they were adopted and applied. Four decades after Arendt's formulation of her principles, the Holocaust finally came to be generally acknowledged as a violent historical rupture, Zivilisationsbruch, and to pick up the formula <clears throat> which opened the historian's debate as a past that does not pass away. In other words, a traumatic past with an ongoing impact. The return of Holocaust memory was facilitated by a number of cultural and historical factors. I'll just give you <coughs> a list here. The introduction of the new term trauma, as a new generally accepted and, um, medical diagnosis and as a theoretical concept which created a new practical and conceptual framework for assessing its meaning. In addition, the term witness and testimony <clears throat> gained a new importance in projects creating large video archives that extended and complemented the historiographical resources because there were no archives <clears throat> for this history. 
um, from the point of view of those who experienced it as victims. Thirdly, a new political commitment to, human, uh, to the human rights paradigm. Although a new declaration of human rights was drafted and adopted by the United Nations in 48 as a response to the Second World War, the successful claiming of these rights uh, also on behalf of Holocaust victims became an effective legal resource only since the 1980s and 90s. And then the opening of archives and the new access to historical documents in Eastern Europe after the fall of the wall, which changed many national narratives. Um, and after 1992 and 1990, and lastly, new media and communication technology. Through a growing worldwide access to digital communication, it became also possible to pr um, put pressure on the claims of victims by publicizing their testimonies and claims in a global arena. The frame of transmission that I have referred <coughs> to as identification mode is not accessible to non-Jewish groups. For these, other meaningful links have been created to connect to the Holocaust. One of these forms of memory developed in the country of the perpetrator was what I call the ethical mode. In Germany, as Raoul Hilberg has emphasized, the Holocaust was family history. This means that here the children of the generation of the Second World War were also transgenerationally linked to the event, but this time through emotions and concepts such as guilt, shame, responsibility and regret. While in the families of survivors, the Holocaust was firmly embedded in the communicative memory of families, anchored in the society and supported by long entrenched cultural patterns, in German families it was passed over in silence. What was traumatic for the one group, wrote Saul Friedländer, referring to the first generation, was obviously not traumatic for the other. The victims of Nazism uh, cope with a um, fundamentally traumatic situation, whereas many Germans have to cope with a widening stain with potential shame or guilt. As the family is a powerful mediator and transmitter of historical experience, descendants of the victims <clears throat> are still facing the trauma of pain and devastating loss, while the descendants of the perpetrators, bystanders and profiteers are actively engaged in breaking the silence and recovering lost traces of the historic crime. The absence of Holocaust memory in European nations had much to do with other traumatic experiences during the Second World War, such as German and Soviet occupation, the Gulag, or the bombing of cities and forced migration. Recovering Holocaust memory in the second generation of Germans involved the very opposite of an act of identification. It required rather a conscious facing and working through this history, <clears throat> along with gaining distance from contaminated traditions and breaking with oppressive family ties that had reinforced complicity and denial. This is exactly the task of the ethical mode, to draw a dividing line between the past and the present, not in order to dismiss the past, like in the call for closure, but to keep it present as a constant warning and memento not to repeat it. This negative memory supports a self-critical <clears throat> memory culture. In Germany, the second generation descending from the perpetrators, the 68th generation, wanted to break as thoroughly away from their own parents as the children of the survivors wanted to merge with them. Longing to distance themselves from their own family background, their country <coughs> um, and its history, some of them took a shortcut and, by, and bypassing the ethical mode, identified directly with the Jewish victims. In psychoanalytic terms, this move has been count, called counter-identification. Again, we are dealing with a merging of self and other, this time in a strategic move that denies one's own history in an attempt to partake of the identity of the innocent victim. For some members of the German 2G, this act of over or counter identification was supported by a strong will to break away from an evil past by radically cutting the bonds of family and history. <clears throat> 
Fantasizing a new identity was an act of emotional and moral rebellion, rebellion verging on conversion, which however did not allow for any personal working through or cognitive historical self-orientation. Among Germans, this emotional fallacy has become the topic of extensive reflection and criticism. And I think of Christian Schneider here in Frankfurt, who is uh, one of them, <coughs> for whom this is a big topic. German historians discovered a similar desire um, of Germans to bracket their own historical genealogy by eagerly joining the transnational memory community of the Holocaust. Reinhard Koselek made this argument when he commented on the new historical memorial in Berlin. And he, he died actually in 2006, but he uh, experienced the inauguration of the monument in Berlin, and this was his comment. Um, sorry. I have not kept up with my <laughs> PowerPoint, I'm sorry. We Germans, he, he said, must not hide between the various groups of victims, least of all behind the Jews, as if we were entitled to a Holocaust memorial just like other countries in the world. This is something that we as Germans have no access to. We are different in that we need to include the perpetrators into our memory. As we must position ourselves in relation to the perpetrators, we are not entitled to focus exclusively on positive heroes like resistors. Positive his, uh, heroes like resistors, denying the historical link to the perpetrators. This was exactly what the GDR had done. The nation focused exclusively <clears throat> um, on them, imagining themselves as victims of the Nazi regime without any responsibility for German atrocities. The dimension of perpetration was externalized onto the other Germany in order not to taint the positive self-image of the heroic nation. The GDR paradigm again was that of identification. This time not with Jewish victims, however, which were, generally, which were generally bypassed, but with communist resistance fighters. In a similar vein as Koselek, Peter Reichel argued against the Germans adopting the date of January 27th, the liberation of Auschwitz, as their central commemoration day. He emphasized that Germans had no right to this day, but should rather focus on dates connected with Nazi crimes perpetrated in German cities, such as November 9th, 1938, a date commemorating German atrocities against Jewish neighbors in all German cities and smaller towns. As the identification paradigm was ruled out for Germans, except, of course, big uh, brackets, except in the heroic counter-narrative of neo-Nazis who romanticize and venerate perpetrators, the new frame of transmission a new frame of transmission had to be created, the ethical mode. Succeeding generations of Germans have developed the ethical mode, turning remembering itself into a strong commitment. In contrast to the perpetrators who prefer to forget, to deny or to justify themselves, the younger generation of Germans took up vicariously the emotional complex of guilt and shame, transforming it into responsibility, remorse, learning, and morning, and we have pa passed across stumbling stones every morning that we, an evening that we walked through Frankfurt, and Gunther Demnig, who invented this mnemonic practice in 1995, is of course also a member of this 68th generation. This self-critical stance characterizes the new memory culture that has been built into the foundations of the German state. The political message of official acts of commemoration includes three dimensions always. First, honoring the victims. Second, preserving the memory of this darkest chapter of German history. And third, citizenship education, political vigilance, respecting human rights, and the principles of democracy. It is interesting to note that the lesson of the experience of the Holocaust is differently interpreted in Israel and Germany. While in both countries the formula is never again, this formula has different meanings in both countries. In Israel, this means never again let us be victims, 
which creates a strong preoccupation with the issue of safety. The issue of safety is aggravated in a political environment of enemies who bring themselves to mind with continuous terrorist attacks. Every threat is perceived as a blow against the existence of the nation and even conceived as a potential second holocaust, to use a term by Alvin Rosenfeld. In Germany, on the other hand, the seminal message is never again let us be perpetrators. Guarding against all kinds of conscious and unconscious repetitions of hyper-nationalism. Holocaust memory in the ethical mode is intended to work as a kind of anti-antidote, a form of vaccination that helps to make the patient immune to a dangerous disease. In philosophical discourse, the Holocaust has always been framed as an event of universal dimensions with global repercussions implicating humanity at large. Josef Chaim Yerushalmi, for instance, described the experience of the Holocaust as, collectively shared, as a collectively shared predicament. He said, all of us tasted of its bitter fruit and know what our predecessors did not know of. This is if this is possible, anything is possible. We all, not just Jews and Germans, but the whole world has lost the tr last trace of naiveness. <clears throat> there is a huge difference here, of course, between universal claims on a discursive level and the actual creation of a transnational community of the Holocaust, a mnemonic, new mnemonic um, practice. But such a transnational memory community has indeed been built up in the beginning of the new millennium by politicians, survivors, and professional experts. On January 27, 2000, the foundations of a new Holocaust memory community were laid in Stockholm in a declaration supported by representatives from 46 states who embraced the responsibility to take Holocaust memory across the threshold of the 21st century and to safeguard it for an indefinite future. In this normative and inclusive transnational um, fame, uh, framework, Holocaust memory reached a growing uniformity at the expense of historical specificity. New transnational patterns and standards often exist side by side nowadays with local preoccupations and initiatives. We spoke already about this fragmentation process. This becomes especially obvious in Eastern European nations, which had to fulfill the EU requirement of building Holocaust monuments, um, museums. In the script of these museums, we can often find a strong European rhetoric, but very little reference to the more complicated and controversial layered history of the specific country and its national narrative. Presently, Holocaust memory is going into two directions at once. It is at the same time becoming more homogeneous, owing to the power of globally accessible media and institutions like the IRA, and more differentiated um, at the same time due to a growing diversity of the populations. With migration and the profound demographic changes, differences in terms of familial and historical legacies are losing their sharp contours and effective energy. Germany today ranks behind the United States and Russia as the most attractive immigration country. Canada, we should of course also mention. Most, more than 15 million people, amounting to 19% of its population, have their roots and historical background now in other countries. At the same time, the connections of the fourth and fifth generations with the Nazi past are becoming ever more tenuous. Under these circumstances, a third frame of transmission and reception is becoming more and more important, and I call this the em emphatic uh, excuse me, the empathic mode, the empathic mode, empathy. This mode of transmission is created through art, literature, film, and <coughs> representations and the products of, po of popular media. 
The first transnational empathic memory community <clears throat> was created through a product of popular mass culture, namely the American TV miniseries Holocaust. <clears throat> Building on identification with fictional characters in a continuous narrative, the film elicited a direct individual response outside and beyond the frames and constraints of collective transmissions. It reached a transatlantic audience, finding a great resonance when it brought, was broadcasted in the US, in Europe and Germany. While the Eichmann and Auschwitz trials had not managed to engage emotionally the larger society and to stir further interest in the history of the Holocaust, this happened unexpectedly with this TV production which opened the hearts and minds moving all generations. The film achieved what political education and pedagogical programs had fallen short of. It broke through the walls of self-defense and indifference, producing a strong and memorable impact in the society. My first two frames of transmission were marked by distinctive filiations and affiliations. The third frame of transmission offers the possibility to transcend such distinctions and categories. It brackets the historically prescribed affiliations and creates a stance that provides more distance than the identification frame and more proximity than the ethical frame. It refers only to the individual self, bracketing the constraints of a collective we. The empathic mode <clears throat> is also inscribed into the identification mode and the ethical mode, of course, but it differs from these frames in offering an individual approach based on the psychological potential of empathy. And uh, this is a little bit of... Uh, <clears throat> Self-promotion um, while I'm talking here about empathy. Empathy is a complex emotion that is constituted by both cognition and imagination, combining intellect and knowledge with feelings and a concern for others. It has been discovered and redefined by neuroscientists who have taught us in studies emerging since the year 2000, and it's interesting, whenever you look at empathy, works, you will not find anything published prior to that year, since the year 2000, that this pro-social emotion is a general human endowment, developing together with the human brain from very early on. It differs from sympathy or identification because it involves a clear consciousness of the difference between self and other. It is elicited not only in personal interaction, but also through the media, which have a great potential for staging impressive images of suffering, but also pro for presenting information and knowledge that can serve as a basis or trigger for empathy. Empathy clearly exceeds the culturally defined and highly gendered <clears throat> range of compassion. It builds a bridge between self and other by creating a sensibility for the suffering of others under the premise that the observer could be subject to the same pain. The affirmation of the other can include also distant groups of individuals, provided that they are judged to be significant others. Not in the sense of George Herbert Mead, but in the sense of Martha Nussbaum, who defines these as being an important part of one's own scheme of goals and projects, important as ends in their own right. Only when the other is recognized as part of my circle of concern can attention be invested and empathy be released. The political and cultural framework of a memory culture, but also media representations, we spoke about Alison Landsberg yesterday, channel and stimulate empathy by bringing others into one circle of concern, translating them into grievable victims, to use a term by Judith Butler. And let me conclude. My first point was that Holocaust memory has changed over time and passed through various stages. It started after 1945 with the victims who wanted to tell their stories in a culture of forgetting. This collective forgetting did not prevail, as one would think, only in Germany, but also in other Western and Eastern countries during, <clears throat> during the Cold War. After 1990, together with the German unification and the 
reconstitution, reconstruction of the EU, we saw the emergence of a new transnational memory culture of the Holocaust taking hold in Germany and other countries. My second point was to draw attention to the social life of Holocaust memory, showing that it is by no means homogeneous, but developed over time in diverse modes and social channels through which it is transported into the future. I call these channels frames of transmission, distinguishing three of them, ethnic and cultural identification, moral responsibility, and emotional empathy. Okay. The frame of the experience of collective suffering on the one hand and the demand for taking collective responsibility on the other will continue to shape national responses and create different stances and meanings in relation to the historical trauma. Empathy is of course involved in both responses, but it may also assume a new meaning and quality for the transmission of Holocaust memory after the passing of the witnesses and the increase of ethnic diversity in the course of immigration. We who come after do not have memories of the Holocaust. When Eva Hoffmann wrote this in 2004, she was referring to her own generation of post-memory. Her we was clearly defined. She spoke of the children of, of the survivors, the second generation, 2G. We can, however, also read this statement as a valid description for a much more general we today, namely the inclusive community of Holocaust memory at a temporal threshold when the concept of post-memory needs to be revised and enlarged. From the highly specific generation marking the hinge between the survivors and their children, it is becoming now a general condition and predicament. Moving along the temporal axis from the second to the third and fourth generation, my condi uh, the condition post-memory is now becoming a condition post-memory, which I prefer to write in two words to distinguish it from Marianne Hirsch's term. What had become embodied by the survivors <clears throat> and to the same extent prolonged by the second generation in the era of post-memory post <clears throat> will have to be created anew in the era of post-memory. This means that the link to this event will have to be reconstructed without the help of an indexical umbilical cord, but will have to rely solely on external and material forms, frames, and symbols. In a few years' time, the Holocaust <clears throat> will have to rely on historic sites and objects and on images, narratives, and other information circul circulating across the globe. Is it still possible and justified to apply the term memory in this era of post-memory? How can memory create an effective link and maintain an embodied living connection to a more and more distant past? I would like to introduce here the figure of the secondary witness. This term was first introduced without a generational limit by Terence Depre and Lawrence Langer. The secondary witness is only confronted with symbolic representations. His and her position is open to any position, person transcending all ethnic, national, and cultural frames. What counts is the mode of reception in which the encounter with symbolic representation takes place. According to Jeffrey Hartman, the secondary witness deals with the Holocaust not as an event in history, but as an event in memory that retains its charge in the present <coughs> for the future. Receiving it as a memory remains, remains that it is received in the modes of identification, ethics, or empathy, with consequences for one's own life, value system, and actions. Such a mode of reception becomes possible through a punctum in Roland Barthes' sense that creates an effective link between the viewer and the object, image, or text. Through such a punctum, new mnemonic energy is injected into the living stream of transmission in the era of post-memory. Participation in such a memory creates an effective community, uh, according to Halbwachs, that is independent from the affiliations created by blood or nation or religion. Empathy, of course, can be blunted, worn out, and blocked, 
but it can also be trained and cultivated by visual and verbal art to expand the realm of experience of the self to include into our circle of concern the suffering experience of others who are not like us. Thank you very much for your patience.